All right, so I have a question. Can you hear someone without really listening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you hear someone without really listening? I don't know about you guys, but my wife and I have gotten in some conflicts and fights over that whole reality. There have been times where my wife will share with me and, and I'm listening to her, and, or at least what I think is listening. And, and so after a little bit, she'll respond back, you're not listening. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm not listening? I've been listening for the past 10 minutes. And I don't mean that towards her. I'm talking about this is my own excuse. But this is what she'll respond back. Because in my head, I'm like, I've heard every word you've just said. But what she's saying is, but you're not listening. You're not understanding what I'm saying. I can hear every word that comes out of my wife's mouth, but there's times where what I'm hearing and what I'm understanding aren't in line. This is where Jesus is now in his ministry is going to start sharing these things called parables, stories, stories that I'll explain what a parable is in a second, but really to do that purpose that for, for people all can hear, but only some will actually understand. That these stories will have crowds that will form around him and, he, and he'll start to begin sharing these parables, these stories, but there will only be some that will really actually understand what he's saying. And so let's read Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13, and we were in Matthew, we took a break for a little while, and now we're back. And there's so much in Matthew that we get to learn, especially as we look at the life and teachings of Jesus. But in Matthew 13, verse 1 is where we'll start. But before we get there, I want to kind of just set up where we're at here. Jesus' popularity has grown. He's at the, pre, the peak and prime of his ministry and its success and so there's crowds constantly gathering around him. They're watching and witnessing his miracles, and, and, and they're coming around hearing his teachings. But in the midst of his ministry and the crowds growing, there's also something else that's growing, and that's opposition. Yes, there's crowds that are forming, but there's also a lot more that are showing their cold and hardened hearts towards him. And the opposition is growing, and it'll continue to grow so much that it'll lead him to be crucified on a cross. If you remember in chapter 12, in chapter 12, remember there's a story where there's a man who is, he's blind and he's mute, and he says that he's, de he's possessed by a demon. Jesus heals this man, casts the demon out, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, again, because they've got to define the supernatural, and there's only two ways you could define that, is either by the power of God or by the power of Satan that that happened. And so rather than give credit to Jesus as doing it by the power of God, because if they were to do that, then they would have to then surrender to the reality that he is the Messiah. But they didn't want to do that. So they made this weird accusation that, hey, the way that you did that was by the power of Satan. That's how you cast out that demon. Jesus is like, really? And he gave his whole explanation of why that's not the case. So you have that situation happens. Then there's a situation where Jesus is in a house and there's crowds all around. And Jesus' mother and brothers come trying to get Jesus' attention. This is all happening on the same day. Now we're in verse 1 of chapter 13. It says that same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. The other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose... They were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. The other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. The other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. 
He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Well, let's go back to verse 1. Again, what I prefaced at the beginning, it says that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And as he sat beside the sea, all of a sudden, crowds are gathering. And so he takes this podium, so to speak, his platform to teach, and he no longer goes on the beach. Now he gets on one of the boats. And he uses the boat as his podium, so to speak, and he sits in the boat. And the crowds are standing on the shore. We should try that one week. I'll sit and you guys stand for the time. (laughs) Right? So here he is. Again, water's behind him. Here's the shore. Jesus is sitting in a boat and he begins to teach the crowd. But differently than how he's taught before. Remember, Jesus would often teach about the kingdom of heaven and repent and he would share and teach. But now he does it more strategically. Again, the opposition has, is arising. People's hearts are showing their true colors and their callousness towards him. And so as these crowds have gathered, Jesus begins to teach in parables. So in verse 3, it says, And he told them many things in parables. And so all throughout chapter 13, you see how Jesus, in this time frame, will teach one parable after another, revealing the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. All in this time frame, on this day, while he's in a boat. But let's ask the question, and and let's try to answer it, what is a parable? What's a parable? The word parable comes from the word parabole in Greek. And why do we say from Greek? Because the Bible, the New Testament, was originally written in Greek. So we want to seek to understand what it meant from the original language. So the word is parabole. So the Greek word para means alongside, while belo means to cast or to throw. So it literally means something cast alongside something else. It's using an earthly story set alongside an eternal truth. It's using an everyday illustration or story that they would be familiar, whether it's around agriculture or something like that, that the the average person would understand. An earthly illustration, so to speak. An earthly story, but set alongside an eternal truth or principle. It is to place or lay something beside something else for the purpose of comparison. So they were stories that Jesus is doing here intentionally, throwing out these stories that are casting alongside a truth in, il- in order to illustrate that truth by way of comparison. It's using an earthly lesson to compare it to an eternal or kingdom truth. It's using the familiar to help us see or think on something eternal. Using the familiar to help us see or understand something of the eternal. Uh, It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, I've heard it called or defined. Or a little story 
with a big message, right? And those are some little the ways that uh, what a parable is. Now, when we look at the parables, and next week we will dive into this parable. So right now, I'm going to kind of give you more of the broad of what is a parable and why did Jesus use parables? And when we interpret the parables, what we need to be careful of is there's, there's usually a main point and concept that Jesus is trying to uh, reveal or unveil to us. So we don't want to hyper, we don't want to look at every little nitty gritty in those uh, stories that he's getting because there's really a main point that he's trying to get accomplished for us to know. And so we want to be really careful that we're not pulling deep theological things from some of those things that Jesus isn't intending. He wants you to see the big, eternal, kingdom-minded truth. And we'll dive into that next week. All right? Um, so here it is. So Jesus begins teaching in parables. And he, he gives a first one. And what, so actually, let's do this. So let's ask the question, what were the purpose of parables? Why would Jesus go into parables? Like, why the hidden meaning? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's two functions for a parable. One is for the outsider. For the outsider, the parable, so for like the Pharisees who their hearts are already calloused, they're already cold, they've been confronted with the truth that he is the Messiah, they've seen miracles, and yet their hearts are hardened and calloused. For them, the parable seeks to hide the truth from those who do not have ears to hear or hearts to hear the truth. It seeks to veil the truth from them. But for his disciples, for those whose hearts are open and leaning in, who actually have ears to hear and eyes to see, it discloses hidden meaning. It seeks to disclose. The one seeks to conceal. The other seeks to reveal. There's a twofold function and purpose that in these parables, to the one whose heart is calloused, They've been confronted with Jesus, but they still do not believe, and their hearts are hardened. Then it seeks to veil and conceal these kingdom principles. But to the heart who is open, to the heart that is leaning in, to the heart that is believing that Jesus is the Messiah, who actually has an ear to hear and an eye to see, then therefore these parables are meant to be revelations, so to speak. They are meant to reveal truths that Jesus wants them to understand about his kingdom. And you'll see each of these parables where he'll talk about the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like, and then he goes on with the parable, a, a, a way of comparison. Okay, so for the outsider, it seeks to conceal or to veil, but to the insider, to the one that God is drawing, to the one whose heart is open, then it seeks to reveal. Warren Wearsby says this about this. In his commentary, he says, a parable starts off as a picture that is familiar to the listeners, but as you carefully consider the picture, it becomes a mirror in which you see yourself, and many people do not like to see themselves. And this explains why some of our Lord's listeners became angry when they heard his parables and even tried to kill him. But if we see ourselves as needy sinners and ask for help, then the mirror becomes a window through which we see God and his grace. To understand a parable and benefit from it demands honesty and humility on our part. And many of our Lord's hearers lacked both. So then Jesus would then go on in verse 3. And he would say this first parable, a parable often known as the parable of the sower, but it actually could be called the parable of the soils. Well, let me read it. He says, he says, and he told them, he told them many things in parables, saying a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other, and other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he says, he who has ears, let him hear. And then now that 
story, that parable we'll, we'll walk through next week. But what's interesting is in Mark, in Mark's gospel, when he gives that same parable, he records in verse 3 where Jesus, as he begins to share that parable, says, listen. Like listening, but also in, in meaning with it, this idea of keep on listening. To, to have ears to hear, to be in tune, to not just hear what's going to be said, but actually listen, seek to understand. See, there's a spiritual connection between our ears and our hearts. There's a spiritual connection between our eyes and our hearts. So when he says you have ears to hear, or eyes to see, in essence, it's what's the condition of your heart? Is it receptive? Can it actually hear not just sound waves, but it can it hear with a faith? Can it hear with a belief, with insight, with understanding? An ear to hear is a heart that believes, a heart that is leaning in and tuning in. It's spiritual healing, hearing with the heart. For you guys that are of the older generation that I am in, and that window and beyond, do you guys remember a little uh, rabbit ear antennas? Remember that? So for you guys that, you know, if you grew up with cable, then you don't understand. But if you grew up like us where we didn't always have a lot of money and some seasons we had cable, some seasons we didn't, then we would have the TV with the antennas that you would have to bend and uh, maneuver to point in a certain direction. And you'd have one of your brothers kind of tell you, hey, like, are we, are we there? Oh, oh, stop. Oh, a little bit more, you know. And we would get home from, uh, from school. And uh, when I was in school, we had the, the cartoon right at the time we got home from school was Batman. And Batman, it was on Fox, and it was a channel that we couldn't get real well on our TV, our old school tube TV. And so you try to adjust some of the antenna or whatever and, and hope that you could see just enough. And the problem with Batman is it was such a dark cartoon, meaning like the colors that they, you know, drew the characters and the animation with. So our TV, you know, with all the blurry whatever, you could only see the outlines of the characters, but there was always that random good day where you got the signal. You're like, yes, we could actually watch the cartoon today, you know? Or do you remember the old knobs? You had click, click, but every once in a while you had to get that click in between the two clicks for it to get the channel just right. You remember that? Right? This idea of tuning in or like your radio to tune in. How many people were standing on that beach that could hear what Jesus was saying, but they couldn't understand. They heard the story of the sower. They were hearing where these seeds were landed, but could they really understand the point behind the four soils? But then Jesus would say, he who has ears, let him hear. As if to say, tune in, listen up, think through. Don't just listen to the sound waves. Properly interpret the sound waves so that you therefore believe and obey what they say. John MacArthur, he says this. He says, Jesus was pointing out to them that they would need more than their own human understanding to interpret the, be the meaning. Only those who accept the king can understand the king and profit from his teaching and lordship. To all others, his teaching is meaningless riddles. But here's the thing. The way that we can really understand is not by our own power or abilities or wisdom. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We cannot understand spiritual things or the things of God or God's kingdom without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that, what did, what did Jesus tell the disciples? That, hey, when I leave you, I'm going to send you my helper, my comforter, and one of the things that he's going to do is guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is the one that unveils truth to us. It's the Holy Spirit that begins to convict us of sin and to awaken us to realize our need for a Savior. 
If you remember Romans chapter 3, it says that no one seeks after God. No, not one. That we don't take the first steps of seeking God. Rather, it's God who seeks us. We are are lost, we are depraved in our sin, and yet God in his grace, and what the Bible says, in his being rich in mercy, and his great love with which he loves us, according to Ephesians 2, he pursued us. Because Ephesians 2 starts out with, while you were dead in your sins and your trespasses. While you were living at the desires. Then in the verse 4 it says, but God. But God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. God is the one who's taken initiative. It's his Holy Spirit that according to Titus chapter 3 regenerates us. It's what a man or woman who is depraved, lost, broken in in his sin, completely blinded, and it's the Spirit that begins to take the veils off your eyes and helps you see the condition of your heart and realize your need for a Savior. That revelation that you have been given to understand your sin and your need for a Savior, and then now in Christ, to understand the things of God is the work of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who inspired all of Scripture, God breathed, that the Spirit led men to record and write down the Scriptures and the truths of God that were revealed from God to man. That same Holy Spirit is what gives us the insight and the understanding to Read, know, apply, and obey God's word. If the average person without the work of the Holy Spirit working in their lives reads this, it won't make a lot of sense, at least in an eternal perspective. They may read some stories. They may read some other things. But unless the Spirit of God is at working, opening up their eyes and bringing the, to help them understand the revealed truth of God's word, we are powerless on our own. So an ear to hear or an eye to see is the heart that has been opened by the work of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus taught both believers and non-believers alike in order to determine who was truly blind. The light was shining for those who wanted to see, but those who chose to be wicked wouldn't see the light and it would only prove their blindness. In Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, to the prophet Ezekiel, and he says, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, who have eyes to see but see not, who have ears to hear but hear not, for they are a a rebellious house. In Matthew 11, verse 13, it says, For all the prophets in the law prophesied until... John, until the time of John the Baptist. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. In verse 15, he says, but he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In the book of Revelation, in in chapter 1, verse 3, it says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. In Revelation chapter 2, you have the seven churches. And at the end of each of what was spoken and warning to those churches, what was declared about them, at the end of each one of those, it says this repeated seven times after each one of them. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Church, do we have an ear to hear? I'm not saying you've sat in church for 20 years and you've heard a lot of things about Jesus and you can spit some information out. I mean, has your heart been enlightened? Has your heart been awakened to realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that reality is only a gift of grace that God and the work of His Spirit has opened up your eyes to realize you need a Savior? Because could it be true that we could be at church, we can hear a lot of sermons, but still be blinded? Yes, it is true. Could it be true like the Pharisees who stood before Jesus, watched him do miracles, heard his teachings, and still said, nah, 
That's of Satan. There is warning for us as a church that when we stand before God, I'm like, well, God, I went to church for 20, like my whole life. Or, God, my parents were Christians. But has there been a point in your life, is there an, a, a, an opening of the heart, a, a veil that's removed off your eyes and realize I was a sinner and I needed saving? And Jesus is that Savior, the one and only and then once there was hopefully that real uh, transformation, then was there a hunger and a thirst for God's word? A desire to know and read and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal who God is, his character and his nature. And how he's calling me to live and how he wants to change me and use me to be his servant and to be part of his kingdom building. Do we have ears to hear this? Is the heart receptive or is it calloused? Are you coming because your spouse wants you to come and so you come to, to make her happy or make him happy, but, but deep down your, your heart could care less. You checked it off the box and that's all it is. Would you pray, would you cry out to God that God would have mercy on you and open up your heart and not let you wander in any more spiritual blindness? So Jesus would continue this parable that he says of the sowers. And in verse 10, it says, as his disciples came, and one of the other gospels, it says, after the crowds dispersed, then his disciples came to Jesus. And they asked this question to him. They didn't ask, what is a, a parable? They're familiar with that. They asked a question which was, why are you speaking to them? Why do you speak to them in parables? Like, Jesus, you just like spit it off all these different stories, these parables to them. And so can you help us understand why? And in Matthew 13, later on in verse 34, it says that he said nothing to them without a parable. And so what Jesus is doing, he's opening his mouth in parables He's uttering what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. See, from Mark's version, the disciples' questioning occurs after the crowd, which I already talked about. And so here's the disciples and followers. They come alongside. They're asking this question. They're eager to know why. And according to Adrian Rogers, here's what he says about why Jesus does he says Jesus had a twofold motive for his reason for using parables? And like I shared earlier, he says his first motive was to reveal, and surprisingly, his second motive was to conceal. So, verse 11, Jesus would continue. He says, and he, his, This is Jesus' answer to their question. He says, To you, again, now it's his disciples. Those whose their hearts have been open, they're believing that Jesus is the Messiah, or, or at least are eager and open and wanting to know more. So Jesus says, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, or to it hasn't to them it has not been given. So the divine reason is that it has been given to you, that God has given you this ability to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. See, their availability to know and comprehend spiritual truths was a gracious gift of God. In John chapter 10, verse, or John chapter 19, verse 10, remember when Pilate, Jesus has been arrested, and Jesus stands before Pilate, before his crucifixion. And then in verse 10 of chapter 19 of John, it says, So Pilate said to Jesus, you won't speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and to have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been what? Given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
And so here's the question he asks him. He says, hey, who do, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And so they respond. They're like, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah or others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he gets more personal. He says, okay, but, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replies with this. He says, you are the Christ. Okay, the Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. And look what the answer is. He says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but who? But my father who is in heaven. That the... the, the, the the confession, the proclamation that Jesus says, when, when Jesus says, who do, you, who, do, who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, because flesh and blood, the wisdom of this world has not made that revelation to you. It was given to you, that understanding to know who I am, he says what? Was revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. So praise God, praise God that the truth of, uh, that, we, that we have come to know in Christ, what a gift of grace that God has revealed to us so that our eyes and our hearts would be open to know and believe. Who am I except a broken, lost sinner who is far from God and he would make known the truths and revelations of Christ so that I could believe and be saved? What a gift of grace. Could I earn it? No. Did I deserve it? No. Could I purchase it? No. But praise God. And why has it been made known? Why these parables? He says, to know the secrets or mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Because they knew and because they believed that in Jesus and who he is and who he was, they were able to now be able to see with spiritual eyes and, was, and to hear with spiritual ears these truths that Jesus is proclaiming through these parables about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. These secrets or mysteries that are truths that have been hidden from all ages but are now being revealed now in and through Christ as Jesus is establishing his kingdom here on earth. Whereas he establishes it where it begins and then it will eventually his kingdom will dwell in the hearts of men who will believe and trust in Christ and then it will come to its full fruition when Christ returns and when he will set up in his reign here on earth for all eternity for all those who have believed and trusted in Christ. Adrian Rogers says this. He says, now these parables, they reveal mysteries. And so there is the mystery of his teaching and you cannot just take cold and calloused hands and lay them upon this book and open up this book and bring to it an undisciplined or undiscipled and uncircumcised and an unspiritual mind and expect to understand this book. He says this book is full of mysteries. Now a mystery in the Bible is a hidden truth. And it cannot be known by human knowledge or by human wisdom. But it must come by revelation. It is, it is a hidden truth that you can only know by revelation. And so Jesus here is speaking in mysteries, and that's the reason that some people don't understand the Bible. They don't have eyes to see. So verse 11, the second half, he says, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. To them, it has not been given. In Mark 4.11, in his gospel account on this same story, it says, Jesus said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, is what Mark's gospel says. In Luke's gospel, on this account, in chapter 8, verse 10, he says, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. Again, he's talking to his disciples. He says, but for others, they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Again, 
the parables in one way is used to reveal truths to those whose hearts who believe and are open to the others to conceal. It's in the same way that the sun, if you were to take a wax candle and put it on the sun, it softens that wax. But the same sun hardens the clay. The one, it softens. The other, it hardens. That is the work of the parables. For the heart that believes, it continues to soften and teach and speak into. To the one whose hearts are calloused, it continues to harden. The more those Pharisees were confronted with Jesus, did did their hearts soften? They became more angered and embittered to the point that they thought he was better crucified and treated like a criminal and put on a cross like a criminal than to say that he's innocent or the son of God. It wasn't like there was this in-between. It was almost like one, it, 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 it's, it's almost like this belief takes you one extreme or the other. Hard in heart, hard in heart, hard in heart, unless, unless God intervenes, left to man on himself. Again, I'm, I'm saying apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, man on himself, it leads to a continual hardened heart. Unless the Holy Spirit intervenes. And to the man or woman who really is born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, then that also should have a heart and a posture that's continually learning, growing, and transforming and looking like Christ, having ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that receives and obeys. Right? There was a story, uh, we need to finish up here, but there was a story of a college professor and yeah, some of you guys already think you know where I'm going with this. Ha, you're not. So just hang in there. All right, because it's not God is not dead movie, okay? It's not that story, okay? Mike Smith, I know you, buddy. <laughs> All right, so listen, there's this college professor, and he asked a question to his students. He says, how many of you in this class believe that the Bible is God's word? And he said it with such a sneer on his face, but no one would raise their hand except for one Christian man that was there in that class. And he knew, and he knew that, that he must be the true, true to his, he, he knew that he needed to be true to his Lord and Savior. And so he lifted his hand and confessed that he believed that the Bible was true and that Jesus was his Savior. And then the professor began to cut at this young man and tear him down and tear down Christ and the one that he believed. And immediately at the beginning of the class, this time, he ridiculed the Bible and he ridiculed Christianity that it was out of date, didn't make any sense. And then the professor gets to the point where he's climaxing all that he says, and he says to this young man, he says, I want you to know that the Bible is a bundle of blunders and a book of nonsense. He's like, I've read it, and it makes no sense to me. And that young man, he responded to him, and he said, Sir, may I say a word to you? And the professor said, what is it? He said, sir, the Bible is God's love letter to his children. If you've read it and it doesn't make any sense to you, it's because you've been reading somebody else's mail. Amen? So let's close our last couple of verses. He says, for to the one, Jesus says, for to the one who has, more will be given And he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In essence, the one who is open and sensitive to spiritual truth and willing to believe, he says more will be given through those parables, more insight, more understanding and knowing these truths. But to to the one who has not, who is not open, who does not believe, will end up losing more or will end up in a worse condition. It's kind of like Muscle strength. You keep working out those muscles, they continue to grow and get stronger. You don't use it, you lose it. So then he goes on. He says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In essence, what we talked about, the human reason is because of their unbelief and hardened hearts. They cannot see. Unbelief is the cause of their spiritual blindness. And the, the, the real simplicity of it is unbelief is the reason for their spiritual blindness. He 
So he would go on in verse 14 and 15, talking about the prophecy in the same way of how the, of the Israelites. And he says, he says, and Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's hearts grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And in essence, in a simple way, by Jesus' Jesus' parables, he's fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. He's speaking in a way that the hardened would hear but not hear, and the hardened heart would see but not see. Why? Because their hearts have grown dull. It was a problem of the heart. So then in verse 16 and 17, he says, Blessed are you, or blessed are your eyes. Again, he's talking to his his disciples now. He says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And so he says, blessed are your ears because they hear and understand. Blessed are your eyes because they see. Blessed because you have believed in me as the Messiah, in which the law and the prophets all point to. Romans 3 talks about that. That the law and the prophets bear witness to Christ. They all point to Jesus. And there are many throughout the Old Testament that would long to be where the disciples and the Pharisees are to stand before the incarnation. Jesus, who was God in the flesh, who was the fulfillment of prophecy, standing before them. Many men and women of old would long to be where they're at. And so blessed are you who your hearts are open and you see and you believe. And I close with you with this verse. In John 1, verse 9, it says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Verse 11, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who gave the right to become, or he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. He gave the right for you to become children of God for those who would believe in his name. Would you stand with me? Do Have you and do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that there is no other name under heaven by which you can be saved? There is only one path, one road that leads to eternal life and to a relationship with the Father. His name is Jesus, and it's only faith alone in Jesus that gives us eternal life. And it's when we put our faith in him that our hearts are awakened and we can now see and know spiritual things. And he fills us with his Holy Spirit so that we can now know the mind and the heart of God. Do you know him? Have you trusted in him? Don't sit here for another day, another month, or another 10 years hearing a lot more knowledge without your hearts being awakened. Do you have ears to hear? Do you have eyes to see? It stems to the heart. Where's your heart at? Does it believe? Let me pray. God, we are thankful for your word. And we thank you, God, for the salvation that you've given us, for the eyes that you've given us to see and to believe in you, Jesus. That it is a gift of grace. And so I praise you, God. I know that the salvation that you've given me was not anything of me. I brought nothing to the table except my sin and my self-righteousness, which was like filthy rags to you. But Jesus, you did all the work. The work was finished and complete on the cross, and your atonement atoned and paid for in full my sins, past, present, and future. 
declaring me as righteous before you, God, because of faith alone in Jesus. And so, God, we praise you for that good news. And anybody here this morning that does not know you, may you reveal and tear off their eyes the veil that's keeping them from seeing so that they would see and know and trust and believe in Jesus alone today. Is today your day? Can you see? Is your heart being convicted right now? Then if it is, then call out to God and say, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I am in need of saving. And I am trusting in you. Trusting in your son, Jesus, who died and rose again for me. And I am believing in that truth and believing in the one and only that salvation is made available through. So I call upon you, Jesus. Save me. Be my Savior and be my Lord. I surrender and submit myself to you and ask that you would help me to follow you, to know you, and to see wondrous things in your word. That I would get to know you and be drawn in deeper intimacy with you, God. In Jesus' name.